Greetings, statistics scholars, and welcome to another video in our sequence on doing statistical inference. In this video, we'll be talking about testing for an association between two categorical variables. It's designed to go with section 7.2 of the text by Locke. In it, we'll be looking at the chi-squared test for association. Let's begin this video with a research question. Suppose we're interested in knowing, is there an association between the baseball team that an Illinois resident prefers and which geographical half of the state that they live in? An interesting question. There's a variety of uh, home teams that are close to Illinois or in Illinois, the Chicago Cubs, the St. Louis Cardinals, Chicago White Sox, Suppose to help answer that research question, we take a survey. And suppose that 500 randomly selected Illinois residents are asked, which of these major teams would you rather see win the World Series? And suppose that those in the survey are given four choices. They can say the St. Louis Cardinals, the Chicago Cubs, the Chicago White Sox, or indicate that they have no preference between those three teams. Now for each individual in the survey, we'll not only record what their preferred team is, but we'll also ask them, do they reside north of Springfield, Illinois, in the northern half of the state, or do they reside in Springfield or further south in the southern half of the state? We ask them those questions and you can see we've got the data recorded there with some totals for each of the categories. We see that out of the 500 surveyed, it turned out that 320 of them happened to be from Northern Illinois, and 180 of them happened to be from Southern Illinois. Now, given this results, we'd like to test a pair of hypotheses. We always have a null hypothesis, and since the null hypothesis is a statement that there is no difference, here our null hypothesis will be that the preferred team is not associated with geographical location. The alternative to that, of course, is that there is an association, that the preferred team is associated somehow with geographical location. If those are our hypotheses, here's an interesting question we might raise about one of the cells of data here. The question I'd like to pose here is, if that null hypothesis is true, thus that ge geography is not associated at all with team preference, how many of those living north of Springfield would be expected to be Cardinals fans? Now we can see from the table how many were actually observed to be Cardinals fans, looking at the number in row one and column one of the table, we can see that out of the 500 surveyed, 127 were people who lived north of Springfield and were St. Louis Cardinal fans. Now that was the observed number. The question that I like to ask here though is, how many should be expected to be Cardinals fans if there is no connection or association between geography and team preference? Well, to answer that, we would have to say that if there's no association between geography and team, then we would expect the number of Cardinals fans living north of Springfield to be just proportional. Altogether, we know that there were 220 Cardinal fans. Well, since 320 of the 500 in the survey lived north of Springfield, 320 out of 500 turns out to be 64%. Since 64% of all of the surveyors uh, lived north of Springfield, if there was no connection between geography and uh, favorite team, you'd expect that 64% of the 220 Cardinals fans should live north of Springfield. When we compute that out, we find an expected number of 64% of 220 being 
we'd expect 140.8 Cardinal fans to be north of Springfield if there was no connection, if it was strictly on a proportional basis. Now, having done that computation there for the expected number of Cardinal fans living north of Springfield, let's see if we can create a general principle that would help us to come up with the expected numbers for each of the other options, like the number of Cubs fans living north of Springfield or the number of Cardinal fans living south of Springfield. Notice that when we computed the expected number of Cardinal fans living north of Springfield, the number 320, which was in the numerator of that fraction, was the total number in the row of that. So if we look at the total number north of Springfield, that's 320. That's the row total. But there's also another number that's essentially in the numerator there, and that's 220. And that's the total number from the column that we're interested in there. So what we're doing is we're essentially multiplying the total of the row that we're in by the total of the column that we're in, but then dividing that by 500, which was our sample size. And that gave us the expected number for a particular cell. So that actually gives us a general principle that we can always use to figure out what the expected number of individuals should be for a particular cell. What do we do? Well, we look at what row that cell is in and what column that cell is in. We multiply the row total by the column total and then divide by the total sample size. Let's do that for each of the remaining seven cells. Let's use that principle to find the expected numbers for each of the remaining ones. gone ahead and done it here and let's take a look at one additional cell for example. Let's look at the second row and the third column. Let's look at the expected number of Chicago White Sox fans living south of Springfield. In that case we're in row two and column number three. Well the total number in row two is 180. There were 180 people altogether living south of Springfield. And the total for column three is 65. There were a total of 65 White Sox fans. So if I take the product of those two numbers, 180 living south of Springfield times 65 White Sox fans, and I divide that by 500, the total number of individuals altogether, I'm going to get 23.4. And that would be the expected number of White Sox fans south of Springfield if the null hypothesis is true. If geography has nothing to do with preferred team, then we would expect it to strictly be proportional. We'd expect that 36% essentially of the 65 White Sox fans should live in Springfield or south of it. And that's 23.4 compared to the 17 that were actually observed. And we've done that for each of the other remaining cells of the table there. If you'd like, you can check each of the other ones on your own. What we like to comment on here is that, of course, the further away our expected values in a cell are from the observed values, that would tend to give evidence against the null hypothesis. Uh, if the null hypothesis is true, then the observed numbers should match the expected numbers, right? But if they differ and to, the, to the degree that the observed number differs from the expected number, that would tend to give evidence against the null hypothesis and evidence for the alternative that there is an association between the two variables. Well, how are we going to quantify that? Let's take a look at how we'll quantify uh, those deviations uh, of the observed values from the expected values. Before we actually look at those deviations, one little note. Uh, for proceeding further, there is a requirement for this hypothesis test. 
For the test for association that we're about to describe to be valid, the expected number for every cell must be at least five. And if that is not the case, you shouldn't go ahead and proceed with the test. Now, in our particular case, if we look back, we we'll see that the smallest of all of our expected values was 14.4, the number south of Springfield with no preference. Since that's the case, we clearly observe that in our scenario, the smallest expected value is 14.4. So that requirement that every cell must have an expected value of at least five is certainly met. And we'll be able to proceed with our test for association. The question is here, how are we gonna compute our test statistic? How are we going to quantify those deviations from between the observed values in the expected values for each cell between the O's and the E's. Well, we're actually going to begin much as we did in the chi-squared test for goodness of fit. What we'll do first for each cell is we'll compute the quantity of the square of the difference between the observed and the expected value divided by the expected value for that cell. You'll recall that's exactly what we did in a chi-squared test for goodness of fit for each of the different categories. Here we're going to do it for every cell in our two-way table. After all, each deviation uh, represents possible evidence against the null hypothesis. Now, any deviation is something that ought to be considered. So once we compute those quantities, square of observed, the square of the difference between the observed and the expected divided by the expected, once we compute those quantities, we're going to sum up all of those values to find the chi-square statistic for our test. In other words, in the uh, first row in the first column, I'm going to take 127, minus 140.8 squared and divide by 140.8. In the first row in the second column, I'm going to take 120 minus 112 squared and divide that by 112. In the first row in the third column, I'll take 48 minus 41.6 squared and divide that by 41.6, and so on and so forth. I'll do that for each one of the eight cells in our two-way table. And then I will sum up each of those quantities. When we do that here, we find that the grand total, the sum of those um, quantities, turns out to be about 8.1185 in this case. Uh, in other words, approximately 8.119 if we round to the third decimal place. And the question is, what do we do with that test statistic now? What sort of distribution does this test statistic use? Here's the rule that we use. Suppose that you have m different categories for your first variable, such as geographical location, and n different categories for the second variable such as preferred baseball team. In other words, suppose you have essentially M different rows and N different columns. In our case, we would say that we have M equal to two because that's the number of categories of geographical places that we had. That was our number of rows. We also had N equal to four because there were four categories of teams. There are four columns for the Cubs, the White Sox, the Cardinals, and no preference. So we had m equal to 2 and n equal to 4 in our table. Once we ascertain those values, here's the rule that we'll use. The test statistic that we've computed will have a chi-squared distribution whose number of degrees of freedom is equal to the product of m minus 1 times n minus 1. In other words, if we take one less than the number of rows, 
and multiply that by one less than the number of columns, we'll have the number of degrees of freedom for our chi-squared statistic. What would that be in this particular case? Well, since we had two rows, two types of geographical location, and four columns, four different team preferences, that means we're going to take 2 minus 1 times 4 minus 1. In other words, 1 times 3, or 3. We'll have a chi-squared distribution with three degrees of freedom. Now that we know the type of distribution and we have our test statistic, that means we'll be able to come up with our p-value. When we determine the p-value for a test for association, we do it very much the same way that we do for a test for goodness of fit. You'll recall from section 7.1 that when we're doing a chi-squared test for goodness of fit, it's always a right-tailed test. The same thing for a test for association. Larger values for the test statistic are going to give evidence against the null hypothesis. So this is a right-tailed test. Here you can see I've used technology, our stat key app, to look at how much area is in the right tail to the right of 8.119 with a chi-square distribution with three degrees of freedom. And we found out that that area is approximately 0 0.044. That's our p-value for this particular test. The p-value is the key value. What is the verdict for the test for association that we're doing? What should we do? Should we reject the null hypothesis or should we not reject the null hypothesis? Remember that our decision in one of these hypothesis tests always rests on the size of the p-value of the test. Small p-values are always going to signify that there is evidence for the claim being made in the alternative hypothesis. In other words, rejection of the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if the p-value is larger than the significance value of the test, we won't find evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So what do we have here? Recall we said in our previous slide that the p-value was about 0 0.044. Now that number is about 4.4%, and that number is smaller than 5%. So if this test was being done at the 5% level of significance, since the p-value is less than that level of significance, we would reject the null hypothesis, concluding that there is an association between the location of an Illinois resident and the particular Major League Baseball team they would prefer to win the World Series there is significant evidence at the 5% level. Now, if we wanted to be a more, bit more stringent, that number is not less than 1%, say. So that result, while significant at the 5% level, is not strong enough to be significant at the 1% level. If you're doing the test at the 1% level, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, finding insufficient evidence of an association. So here we might say we have evidence, though not extremely strong evidence, for the association. I hope you found this video to be helpful uh, and useful in your learning on tests for association between two categorical variables.